Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's great to chat with Rich Roll on the podcast. Named one of the 25 fittest men in the world by Men's Fitness and the guru of reinvention by Outside, Rich is a globally renowned ultra endurance athlete, wellness advocate, best selling author, husband, father of four. Rich shares his inspirational story of addiction, redemption, and optimal health in his number one best-selling memoir, Finding Ultra, and the cookbook and lifestyle guides, The Plant Power Way and The Plant Power Way Italia, which he co-authored with his wife, Julie Piat. Rich has been featured on CNN, on the cover of Outside Magazine, and has been profiled everywhere from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal. His latest book, Voicing Change, features timeless wisdom and inspiration from the widely popular Rich Roll podcast, one of the top 100 podcasts in the world with over 100 million downloads. Rich, I'm so uh, excited to chat with you today. Thanks for having me, Scott. It's good to see you. Excited to dig into this, man. Yeah, to get me all pumped for this interview, I went for a run this morning and I was like trying to channel my inner Rich Roll uh, as, I, <laughs> as I did my one mile run. <laughs> nice. That's great. Yeah. You know, I like to have goals, you know, like I run to the coffee shop, do you know what I mean? So then I can have my favorite coffee, but that my goal is like the coffee, not the run. <laughs> That's all right, man. Whatever gets you there. Yeah. No, it's really exciting to chat uh, with you. I, you know, I'm a psychologist, as you know, and I'm really interested in sort of the narratives that people uh, looking back kind of when you look at your whole life story and you try to think, well, what, try to make sense of it all, you know, uh, and and, you know, in researching you and uh, for this podcast, I identified it looked like there's three, at least three major transformations um, that are part of this narrative. It's funny when you you, do, you look at um, uh, research on you or, you know, articles about you, they tend to focus on this, you know, the one, this one transformation from alcoholism to an elite athlete. But I like to look at more you know, nuanced level of things. And this is the psychology podcast. So I was hoping we could chat today and kind of do a case study of rich role and, and what uh, those lessons can offer to anyone aspiring to greatness. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I'm, I'm all about it. Like uh, the more we can make this a therapy session, the better. Well, let's do it. I'll, I'll treat you like a patient. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it, well, one thing I'm really a big fan of in uh, in uh, moving this the psychology direction, the the whole field of psychology more into a more positive psychology direction. So not focusing entirely on what's wrong with someone or going from negative fifty to zero, but what does it mean to go from zero to positive fifty, right? And you know, when I was looking at your your story, you know, I, I'll just tell you the three major transformations I saw, and I'd love to hear you. Uh, tell me what you think of that. So it seems like there was this one big transformation where you uh, you decide you were an alcoholic. You know, you were an alcoholic, and you went through. You decided enough was enough. You you the rubber met the, met the road. You know, at a certain point, uh, I believe you were in jail. You found yourself in jail at one point, and and uh, you're like, you know, enough is enough with this, and uh, and you went through the 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 steps and the commitment to uh, not not be an alcoholic. But then it seemed like there was this period of about ten years in your 30s and 40s, we were a lawyer. Um, you were not an alcoholic, but you were still kind of transferring addiction from one thing to another. So you weren't an alcoholic anymore, but it seems like you were still, a, you know, you were still addicted to to something, you know, and it, it may be success, maybe uh, money. And I'd love to hear more about what you thought you were addicted to and how you would put it from your 30s to, to 40s. And then in your early 40s, it seemed like there was a third transformation. And that's the one I really want to you know, after we cover the first two, I really want to nail what is this this new transformation because that's not in the stories about you. That's you know when I read these kind of journal articles about you, they again they seem to focus so much on from alcoholism to endurance athlete. But there's this third you know uh, awakening that I that I see you having having now, and and I'd love to discuss that. So let's start focusing on the first transformation. So can you tell me a little bit uh, more about uh, why you decided and and what and how you got that will? to once and for all overcome the alcoholism? Well, 
as any good uh, recovering alcoholic will tell you, uh, you know, alcoholism tends to move. It's not a linear progression, but it tends to move in, 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 in you know, in one direction. As they say in the rooms, you either end up in, in jail or an institution or death. And I had, you know, checked two of those boxes. There was only one left. Uh, I was holding on to it desperately for life, though, because it was my best friend and it was my coping mechanism. And I couldn't imagine life without it. And I had gone through, you know, some trauma with a marriage that got fi- that failed. And despite, you know, my life kind of um, falling apart around me and people fleeing from the hills, I refused to, you know, basically deal with this problem that that, you know, was so evident and leading me into a pretty dark place. And at the end, you know, there's nothing sexy or romantic about it. I was just alone, you know, in kind of a sad apartment drinking by myself around the clock Mm -hmm. uh, with nobody to call and nobody calling on me. And ultimately, you know, I woke up one day and it wasn't, you know, I was hungover, but it wasn't that different from many, many other days, uh, similar days. Mm -hmm. But I just had had enough, like the switch got flicked and I was like, I cannot live this way anymore. And at the time I'd been seeing um, an addiction psychologist. Really? Uh, And that that was an interesting, uh, you know, experience that my parents didn't want anything to do with me anymore, but they did hook me up with this psychologist and said, will you please just at least go talk to this guy? And and I did, and I was seeing him. It was so clear to him that I needed to go to a treatment center, that I needed to be you know, extracted from my environment and placed in a, a more structured environment. And I didn't think that I needed to, and I thought that I could solve this problem by myself. And I'm somebody who's driven by self-will and in many ways had premised my life on my sort of workhorse capacity to succeed. And when I would look in the rear view mirror, I would say, I got, I, I accomplished all of these things because I know how to outwork everybody else. I know how to solve problems on my own. There's no reason why I can't solve this problem myself either. And I was really reluctant to let anyone else in because of a lot of shame and other reasons that scared me. So I was in this sort of game playing thing with him where He would say, you know, I think it's time to go to treatment. I'd say, well, let me, I think I got it this time, you know, but if I relapse again, then we can resurface this conversation. He was like, Mm -hmm. okay, like he never pressed me because he knew I would go out and relapse again. And then I did, of course, and this happened several times, but eventually me being this person who thought I was like a man of my word, even though I was this, you know, bad actor and a horrible liar who couldn't show up on time for anything or, or, you know, handle my life in any responsible fashion. After yet another relapse, I, I slunk back into his office <laughs> and I told him, uh, yeah, I relapsed again. And because I was such a man of my word, I said, okay, we'll, we'll do it your way. And I agreed. And he helped get me a bed in a, in a facility up in Oregon um, called Springbrook Northwest. It's now been taken over by Hazleton. Uh, and that's how, you know, I ended up in a treatment center. But I went into that experience thinking, you know, I, I need to get in and out of this as quickly as possible because, you know, I've got this, I'm a, you know, I'm a lawyer and I have responsibility, all this nonsense, right? Mm. And, you know, this guy who walked the planet thinking he was a pretty smart guy, turns out maybe not so smart. And that really, once I, you know, the fog cleared, that really landed on me. And I, mm. and I realized mm. that, um, that I needed to figure this out. And, I became willing, willing to ask for help and more importantly, willing to receive help. And that willingness, I think, is really what allowed me to not only get, st- get sober, but, but stay sober. Yeah. You know, in the field of psychology, there's, we talk about grit as though it's a trait, you know, this, a personality trait. And, and what's interesting about this story, this, at least this first transformation, is it doesn't sound like you were a particularly gritty person in college or um, you know, when you were, when you were an alcoholic, you know, you were disorganized, you know, you didn't, you weren't displaying those personality traits. Now, I don't know if it was a matter of maybe you were a perfectionist and, and some people go to alcoholism because they are so overwhelmed with the fact that they can't control everything. And as they're so overwhelmed that they, they aren't living up to their highest potential. I don't know if that was part of it. Um, but what is interesting to me is how you could almost overnight go from 
uh, someone who doesn't appear gritty as all, at all to, uh, quite frankly, one of the most gritty individuals who's ever lived <laughs> on planet Earth. Well, I, I do think that I, I, I am actually pretty gritty. And mm. despite you know, my life kind of capsizing in that way, for a long time, I was a very functional alcoholic and mm. you know, was able to still you know, get good grades at Stanford and get into Cornell Law School and somehow graduate law school and get a job in a law firm That's and true. not lose that job. Uh, so I was balancing these two different worlds. And, and that grittiness, I think, is something that I developed young as a competitive swimmer um, which is really kind of what brought me to Stanford in the first place, like competing on this unbelievable team of world record holders and Olympic athletes and NC2A champions. Um, and I, as an athlete, you know, I had some modicum of talent, but I wasn't Olympic caliber. I was never going to be Olympic caliber. Mm -hmm. And any success that I that I had as an athlete was by dint of learning how to outwork everybody. So I was the guy in high school who got up at 4.30 every day and swam for two hours and went to school and, and then went back to the pool for two more hours, then went, did homework and was in bed by nine. And, and you know, by like learning how to show up and w learning how to outwork everybody else in the pool, I was able to go from pr a pretty medium talent to somebody who was recruited at all these colleges and, you know, one of the outstanding swimmers in my region. and you know, top eight in the country in my age group and my event. So, you know, I, when I, you know, when I, when I was talking about self-will, like that's what I'm like, I, I understood how to, um, how to will my way into a successful situation. And I think grit plays a part there. The thing with alcoholism is that grit doesn't work and self-will doesn't work because it's very much a, a, a surrendering process, a letting go, a shedding, as opposed to kind of a forcing energy. Thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that that clarification. I mean, you know yourself more better than I know you, so it's good to hear about, um, you know, what were you like there as even in high school? You know, like what what what? How would you describe your personality? You know, structure. Even in, I was yeah. I was a very you know bookish introverted kid. Mm. I was a kid who, you know, in elementary school, you know, was ridiculed and bullied and had an eye patch and and headgear. You know, <laughs> really, <laughs> get my you know my beanie in the winter times at the bus stop stolen and, you know, just not a kid who showed any athletic promise whatsoever. Mm. Had a lot of difficulty making friends and was kind of a sensitive, kid and mm. struggled. You know, and I think with that, I just turned inward. And, you know, now it's clear to me that the swimming pool was really my first drug of choice. I mean, that was like a safe haven when I discovered that I in, not only enjoyed swimming, but was pretty OK at it. Um, that's where I gravitated. That became um, not only like my focus and my passion, but also my social circle outside of school because it didn't have anything to do with school. But when my head was underwater, all that anxiety and sort of um, dissatisfaction or, uh, you know, those those feelings of insecurity and, and self poor self-esteem mm -hmm. were muted by, you know, being underwater and, and being kind of away from the world. I think that that, you know, there's a there's a relationship there between alcoholism and my relationship with swimming in the pool in that phase of my life. That's that's really super interesting. I wonder how how much you see that link among competitive swimmer swimmers. You know, I don't even I don't know if that's ever been studied. Well, I do know that in the in the endurance community and specifically the ultra endurance community, mm -hmm. where you know these these are kind of ragtag races where uh, you know there's no media and there's no prize money or things. People are sleeping in tents and they're running 50 miles or 100 miles. There's a lot of people in recovery that are in that community. Lots of tattoos, lots of you know ex junkies, yeah, yeah. And, and somebody should really do a study on that correlation because I think it's fascinating. It's it, there's something about, you know, I think I think an argument can be made that that alcoholics and drug addicts are 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 fundamentally seekers you know, spiritual seekers. They're looking for answers. They're doing it in a very unhealthy way, but there's something about this life that um, that isn't doing it for them. And they're trying to find out, you know, uh, they're trying to, they're seeking for a higher state of consciousness, right? They're doing it through a substance, but ultimately endurance sports is, 
you know, a, a different kind of template for that exploration. For sure. And you see people in that community, in the biohacking community, um, you know, people who might be in, interested in ultra endurance sports, really interested in experimenting with nootropics, for instance. You know, I wonder mm -hmm. if it's a similar sort of seeking, you know, even though nootropics obviously aren't, it's not the same thing as alcohol, but. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there is something to that, I think. Okay. Let's go, let's go to your thirties. Thirties. Uh, you're in your thirties, you become a lawyer. What, what is the transformation there, you know, from immediately from not being, uh, an alcoholic anymore and, uh, and entering, uh, adulthood, entering a profession? Well, I, I kind of emerged from the treatment center where I lived for a hundred days. I was in treatment for quite a long period of time. Um, and when I emerged from that, uh, it was scary. Like now I have to go back into the world. My law firm had been very supportive of me during that time, but I had to go back and work there, <laughs> you know, after having this transformative experience. So I took my toolkit of things that I learned and returned to Los Angeles and made sobriety my number one priority, like basically, you know, completely immersed myself in the AA community here in town, um, going to two meetings a day and working with newcomers and getting a sponsor and just making a whole, I needed a whole new set of friends. Like I had to completely overhaul my, um, my social circle. Uh, at the same time, I was very intent on making up for lost time and, you know, reestablishing myself as an upwardly mobile, you know, responsible professional. Um, and I think, you know, I shouldered, a tr I put a lot of pressure on myself. Some of that pressure emanates from parental expectations. Um, I grew up in a household where my, you know, it was a very education focused place and mm. my dad's a successful lawyer and there was, he was never like a, um, you know, it wasn't like a super intense environment, but there was just kind of this air, you know, that, okay, you're, these are the things that you're going to do in the world. And, mm. and I was trying to live up to those expectations. And, and also, you know, I had a lot of shame because as a young person, you know, when I was 18, I was, you know, one of the best swimmers in the country. Mm. I got into every college that I applied to. I got into Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Amherst, like all these places and showed up at one of the greatest uh, universities in the world to be a member of, at the time, the greatest collegiate swim team ever. So the world was like my oyster. I mean, there were, you know, it was like, you know, like I could have, you know, like the path was the doors were swinging wide op open for me. And there was a lot of like, oh, Rich is gonna do something big in the world or, you know, and, and, I, and then I screwed all that up and made a disaster of my life. And so yeah. throughout my thirties, I was trying to, you know, recapture some aspect of who that guy was when I was 18. I didn't have a mastery over the spiritual tools required to mm -hmm manage what alcoholism is, how it manifests in every other facet of your life. So, you know, I was workaholic, you know, panicked about finances and trying to make money and trying to, you know, you know, impress people <laughs> with stuff and status and, and, and the like. And, you know, along the way, never thought for a second, like, maybe I shouldn't be a lawyer, or maybe I should do something else. Or what is it that, you know, would make you happy, Rich? I was just focused on achievement. And I think yeah. a decade spent trying to jam a square peg into a round hole and grinding my teeth and, you know, just trying to make it work. Eventually, you know, I cracked and it led to an existential crisis that basically, uh, developed in parallel with uh, a decline in my health because I've been overlooking my well-being and medicating myself with junk food and terrible lifestyle habits. So despite having been this swimmer in college, you know, I wasn't exercising really. I was just working 80 hour weeks and had put on 50 pounds and would hit the drive through on the way home or order the Chinese takeout in the law firm. And, you know, when you're young, you can get away with that stuff. But, you know, by 39, it had really caught up to me. And so it all kind of came to a head uh, shortly before I turned 40, where um, I had this moment walking up 
the flight of stairs to go to sleep after a long day at work and a bunch of cheeseburgers in my gut where, you know, I had, I was too winded to complete that, that staircase yeah. assault, had to take a break, had some tightness in my chest, heart disease runs in my family. And it was a, it was a scary moment where, you know, for the second time I had this kind of, uh, you know, moment of awakening and this dawning realization that I just couldn't live my life this way anymore. And I think because I had, I had, um, had that, you know, awareness with my drinking and ended up in a treatment center and, you know, 10 years had passed and I was so aware of how dramatically my life had improved and changed by, by virtue of making that one single decision that I had, I think, a, a hypervigilance around like it happening again. Like I, I knew when it was happening, like this is exactly like when I decided to go to go to treatment. Like I, I'm being gifted another opportunity to yeah. once again make some changes that could be significant in my life. Um, and I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. I think I think we're all we all are visited by moments like this. I think, but most most of the time they pass because we don't honor them um, as much as we should, or we're we're too disconnected from ourselves to kind of recognize them when they arise. Yeah. So, what were the changes you made in your early forties, and and what led you to running a five? Ironman distance. You ran right. you you ran five Ironman distance events in seven days. Is that right? Right on five different Hawaiian islands. And five different Hawaiian islands. Yeah, no big deal. So, uh, what so, what what led to that? So what happened was, uh, you know, my whole my rubric is twelve step. Like that's what got me sober, and that was what I was familiar with. Um, I was very you know, and still am you know, steeped in that in that community. So in the wake of that staircase experience, I, I, I kind of was trying to leverage what I'd learned in 12 step and figure out how to apply that to general lifestyle habits. And all I knew is that when I showed up in a treatment center, they threw me in detox for a couple of days until I sobered up. And I just thought, I need that for my life, right? You know, I need that for food. I need that for, you know, basically I need to detox myself off, off of my lifestyle habits. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? Well, I thought, why don't I do a juice cleanse? Like that seems to be things that, that you know, a lot of people do. My wife had done it before. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd never gone a single day in my life without eating solid food. So she helped me sort that out. And for seven days, all I did was, you know, drink pressed juice and some broths, like no solid food. And, you know, my thinking in doing that wasn't that, oh, I need to, remove the toxins from my body. I just needed to do something hard that would trigger the same emotions that I experienced outside of my comfort zone that would be difficult to kind of reboot my operating system and reframe like so I could start fresh, like wipe the slate clean. Mm -hmm. And I that that experience achieved that. Like it was very difficult. The first couple of days I'm laying on the couch, sweating just like you would if you were trying to get off heroin or something. And then, you know, by the end of that week, I felt unbelievable. I, f I had a clarity uh, uh, of mind and a body, like a resurgence in vitality. And it was such a short period of time. And I, I think that that planted the seed that food really can be medicine, like what you put in your body actually does impact how you feel, which is something I'd never thought about at all, really. And that catalyzed my motivation to continue this search and also find a way of eating that would allow me to feel like that all the time. Because the alcoholic in me is just thinking, well, I'll just do this cleanse forever. Like I got addicted to that feeling of what it felt like. I, got, I don't want to go back to food. I want to keep doing this. And my wife was, you know, had to disabuse me of that. You know, like that's a very alcoholic thought. Um, <laughs> and that took some time to figure out like how, you know, and it, it wasn't, in, it, you know, I tried a bunch of diets and, yeah. It wasn't until, you know, I, I took a stab at eating 100% plant-based diet that, that, you know, that I connected with what worked for me. And I've been eating that way ever since. And um, with that, you know, kind of renewed vigor, that got me interested in physical movement again, which is something that started very casually. I had no desire to returning to becoming a competitive athlete. Um, but very quickly by, you know, dusting off an old pair of running shoes and riding a bike occasionally and hitting the pool, um, 
you know, very casually. Uh, the, the weight came off really quickly mm-hmm. and the fitness returned pretty rapidly and I was seeing incredible gains in a short period of time. Um, and then I had an experience like four or five months into this where you know, I dropped into like a crazy flow state on a run that was intended to just be like an hour. And I ended up running like 24 miles, which was something I'd, I'd never, I'd never run that far before in my life. I couldn't believe that my body could do that. I thought, you know, any, any kind of athletic excellence was well in my rear view as a 40, 40 year old man at this point. Um, and that got me interested in, in, in seeking out a challenge for myself. And I think part of that was a little bit of midlife crisis. Like, oh, what do you do when you turn 40? You do an Ironman, like it's kind of a trope. But, and you know, meets, uh, I meets this nagging feeling that I had that I never achieved my potential as an athlete because alcoholism, you know, really destroyed my swimming career. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, and I think most importantly, for the first time, I was trying to address this existential crisis. Like I'm this lawyer, but like I can't stand being a lawyer, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do with myself. Um, I don't even know how to begin to unpack that journey of self inquiry to figure out like what my blueprint is or even what gets me excited. All I knew is that I really enjoyed endurance exercise and started doing more of it. And it was reconnecting me with this really just um, innocent joy that I experienced as a kid. These things made me happy and it was really just about that. But soon it clicked in that it's all it, that it's what we were talking about before that it can be this 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 um, this means for spiritual exploration. There is something about being alone, you know, for an extended period of time with an elevated heart rate, you know, focused on your breath that triggers this, you know, active meditative state that really allowed me to drop deep into myself and play with those questions, wrestle with them. And ultimately, you know, I, endurance sports played a huge part in helping me, you know, figure, figure that out. Um, the success that I've had in endurance sports is, is not that important to me. It, it's the thing that people seem interested in. But when I look back on the things that I've done, they've all just been tools to help me um, become a better, more self-actualized person so that I can be a better servant for others. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H-E-L-P slash psychpodcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Okay, now back to the show. Um, 
Yeah. So thank you for, for saying all that. You know, it's really interesting to think about your addiction proneness uh, tendencies because it seems like it's a feature of you, not a, not a bug. Um, you know, my, my friend, uh, Stephen Kotler, um, my friend Stephen Kotler, who does a lot of work on flow, he, 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 has, he said that flow is the most addictive state uh, known to humankind. Yeah. So it's funny because you're kind of saying like, um, you know, I went from being addicted to then I really started to love the flow state. And I was like, well, I think you probably got addicted to the flow state, but I don't think that's a, ne- I don't say that as a negative thing. You know, I say that as a, as um, this, this is what I see with you because you're an all in kind of guy. Like, you know, yeah. you, you're, you, you, you don't believe in balance, you know, you believe in, this is who you are. This is your authentic, this is the, the authentic you. It wouldn't feel authentic to you, I imagine, if I, if I, if someone tried to force you and, you know, like, it, probably that's why the lawyer profession didn't really, uh, didn't really make you feel as authentic as possible. So whatever you're going to do, you're going to go all in. And, um, and w- when one can put all these labels, I'm not a fan of labels, Rich, you know, one can say, can use the words addiction to describe certain uh, states of consciousness. And it, it probably just doesn't even make sense to apply certain labels to certain things. But that feeling of the flow state is, is um, you know, and all the neurochemicals that are activated during that flow state and that give us pleasure, that give us a sense of uh, tranquility. And uh, of course, it's going to want to make you return to it again and again and again. Mm. Yeah, uh, 100%. Um, I'm definitely you know, somebody who's never been able to crack the balance code for a long time, you know, I would, I would feel bad about myself trying to figure out how I could be more balanced. And finally, I just let go of all of that and just realized like, it's not me. And why am I trying to yet again, you know, jam a square peg into a round hole with this? Like I am an all, all, all in person and I'm going to stop um, judging myself for that and instead try to find a way to manage it in a healthy way. And, you know, I th- so the way I look at it is, you know, the pendulum's always swinging and mine tends to swing, you know, a little bit further than other people in either direction, but it always swings back. You know, certainly uh, I, I do love, you know, going all in on something, but I have many things in my life that are important. And if mm-hmm. those aren't getting attention, then nothing else matters. Everything is going to capsize around me. So, oh, you know, totally. I can only go, I, I don't, li- you know, it's, I have friends that mar- who have been married for a long time and they fantasize about the golf trip with their buddies in Las Vegas. And I think about living by myself in the woods and just being able to do what I want to do all day long. You know, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, so oh, I can yeah. go all in and nobody's going to bug me. I mean, to me, that's bliss, you know, to a lot of introverts and just people who value solitude, that's, that's bliss. I mean, to a lot of people, this pandemic is, you know, you're, you're supposed to complain, you know, oh, it sucks that I have to be on Zoom and I can't go to the workplace. But a lot of people are secretly being like, this is amazing. <laughs> I don't have to go outside too much right. and interact with humans. I can, you know, but, it, but it just seems like this, um, you know, this idea of authenticity and, uh, it, it it's not a, it wasn't a matter of like shedding things it was a matter it was a matter of like becoming you know who you who you were meant to be you know uh, you didn't like let go as much as um, I mean you certainly let go I mean that's certainly part of the story of course but there was certainly this um, you know this authentic process that you went through uh, was really a, like a process of acceptance in a lot of way um, mm-hmm. and integrating who you are as uh, you know I talk a lot about the importance of integrating the dark side, you know, and, and you had this full acceptance that you're an all in kind of guy. And what an amazing, like, um, to me, that's a transformation itself for someone to embrace, you know what, this is who I am, but I'm going to, um, apply this and integrate this to higher values instead of other values that I've had in the past. It takes a lot of bravery. Mm, I appreciate that. You know, I, I still, you know, I get asked a lot like, well, aren't you just still um, living your life alcoholically? Like whether it's these crazy, super long races yeah. or um, the other things that, that interest me. And, and you know, I always validate that. I'm like, probably, you know, me, you know, it's like it's not for you could have your perspective on that if that's your perspective. Like I don't drink or use drugs. Um I certainly can be alcoholic in, in, in my pursuits. 
Um, but what is exact? What exactly does that mean? And when is it okay? And when is it, you know, the moment to recalibrate? And the only way that I know how to do that for myself, because I'm a poor judge of my own behavior, is to surround myself with people who give me feedback, who say, who know me, know the best of me, and know when I'm starting to get off track. So I don't have those blunt thoughts. What does off track mean? Is off track usually um, something involving ego? I mean, can you describe what, do you know what off track means? Oh, it can mean a lot of things. I mean, yeah, yeah you know, my, my natural disposition is to be irascible and grouchy and self-serving and selfish and irritable and, <laughs> and, and blind to, you know, the fact that there are other people in my life that rely upon me and need me and, all the like. Uh, so, you know, I have to be constantly um, reminded that or otherwise I'll retreat into my shell, you know, which is kind of like, you know, in this pandemic, like you were talking about, is easier and easier yeah. to do. Um, and, you know, when I'm working my program and I'm you know, doing all the good stuff, like I'm, I'm pretty good, but, you know, I'm highly imperfect at all of this. And so I just think it's important to have, you know, friends and people that know you, who, who, who you check in with that you tell the truth to. So they can say, they can be the mirror, you know, that, that I'm unable to see. So I'm going to give you a mirror that, that it seems like you're unable to see. Uh, when Lewis Howes was on my podcast uh, about a, a couple years ago, I asked him out of everyone you've ever interviewed, um, and you've interviewed a lot of people in your podcast. You know, I was talking to Lewis. He does this greatness podcast. Um, I said, "Who who inspires you the most?" And he said, without even thinking about it, he said, "Rich Roll." He said, oh, wow. "He said um, Rich Roll is the kindest, uh, most inspiring." A person who I aspire to become as a as a as a man, you know, as a person, and so there's something there's something interesting here in that you know you you find that some people who have this kind of self image of themselves as you know you described yourself as irascible as all these things, those people sometimes having that self awareness is actually what allows them to create a value system in their life consciously and intentionally that allows them to paradoxically inspire um, people more so than those who aren't uh, self-aware of those tendencies within themselves. They're just tendencies that you've become aware of, and that has been a benefit to you becoming pain painfully and, and, uh, and without any self-illusions aware of it. I don't know. What do you think? How does some of this hit? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we're all victims of our character defects to one degree or another. Um, and, and I've just learned, uh, you know, mostly through being an Alcoholics Anonymous mm. to uh, develop self-awareness around those things, to own them and, and work through them so that they don't um, cause the kind of shame that leads to one trying to hide it from other people. Like I, there's something very powerful about just owning who you are and <laughs> doing it in a, in a way that uh, um, shows that it doesn't, it doesn't hold any uh, emotional baggage for you. Like, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is what I do. You know, like if I don't do this, then this is how I act. And I think that's refreshing for other people because it gives them permission to be honest and it allows them to emotionally it, it it it's a breeding ground for intimacy right like if you i always try to lead with vulnerability you know i don't have everything figured out i've been successful in certain things but but um if i really want to connect with another human being like i have to be vulnerable first to give them the permission to be vulnerable and when i do that that's where true connection happens and there's a difference between um performing, you know, like be perform per, performative vulnerability, which you see a lot of in social media right now, because people think it's, oh, it trends well, it's cool to be vulnerable. There's research on that, yeah. And that's actually dishonest, you know, that's, that's the antithesis of vulnerability in certain ways. Um, so I'm always running that calculus um, and trying to um, put my ego in the back seat instead of in the driver's seat. And when I do that, 
I'm able to develop uh, deeper relationships with other people. And I find that Mm -hmm. the things that I care about talking about um, tend to connect better with the people who are interested in what I have to say. Oh, absolutely. And you do that in your in your podcasts um, so well to elicit stories from people. People aren't going to be vulnerable. The stories aren't going to be pretty good. Stories are not going to be good if they're not vulnerable at all. Right. You know, a lot of a lot, that's a key component of a lot of the stories that really grab at people's, um, you know, hearts in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. That, you know, yeah. just to circle back to the research and what you're talking about, there is a, a concept called vulnerable narcissism that I study. And uh, have published papers on this, and it is a it is a trait that uh, people uh, often talk about the grandiose narcissist, like the Donald Trump type of chest thumping narcissist. But but in this in the clinical literature, the ones who end up on the psychologist's couch tend to be those who are vulnerable narcissists. They feel as though their vulnerability entitles them to special privileges, as opposed to a grandiose narcissist who thinks that they're entitled to special privileges because they're great. So. There's a whole literature on this. It's it's interesting. That's <laughs> got I would like to read some of that literature. I'll send That's it to amazing. You. Yeah, I'll send it to you. So, uh, I'm trying to extract in doing research about you. Uh, I wanted to extract some, um, you know, reoccurring patterns of things you, you talk about that I think really can inspire a lot of people, um, and offer an example, a vulnerable, a vulnerable example of, um, uh, of of what one could be. Um, so one area that I think we're both really interested in is growth and self-actualization. Um, you know, I've been on this project to uh, to bring the human potential movement, you know, from the Esalen era into the 21st century, and I'm uh, really committed to uh, to understanding uh, human basic human needs and how they get in the way of self-actualization. So one common area of interest with both of us is this idea of choosing growth. And I'd love to hear some more of your thoughts about this, but, you know, you talked once, you said, every decision I make is moving me towards a drink or away from it. And we can build that principle up to everything in life, right, uh, Rich? I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about that, you know, because it's, I think it's a really profound, uh, profound idea once we start building that up to one's entire right. lifestyle. Well, let me preface this by saying that although I may choose growth, I, I do it begrudgingly, and it's truly <laughs> You know, only pain that that actually gets me to change any of my BS. Um, you know, all these levers that we're talking about, you know, in my life were motivated by being in a sufficient amount of pain, where the pain of my current state um, outweighed the fear of change or the fear of the unknown. Like it's yeah. just a weird thing that as human beings. Um, we're so recalcitrant, we're so reticent to change our behaviors or our patterns. And it's not until we're, you know, in some crisis that we're even willing to entertain that, despite the fact that change is available to all of us at any given moment. So for me, the best way to remind myself of that or to kind of um, maintain some conscious awareness of it is to snap myself out of this delusion that things are static. You know, we're all talking now about like, when are we gonna get back to things being normal? Like things are never gonna go back to normal. And even if, you know, even when we get past the pandemic, there's a lot of ways in which we're, society is now structured that are not gonna bounce back to the way that things were before. Um, There is no real normal. Everything is constantly changing and in flux. And the more that you can be present with that, truth, I think the more malleable you can be. So that adage of, yes, every thought that I entertain, every interaction that I have with another human being, every behavior that I indulge is either is either moving me towards growth or or regressing me back to, you know, some person that I don't want to be. And that kind of mantra is really a practice in mindfulness, right? It's it's developing a greater awareness of truth, and it's about being anchored in the moment and not um, living in the past or future tripping. You know, it allows you to step a little bit outside of the stories we tell ourselves about who we are that so often, you know, most of the time become predictors of what we will do in the future because they're based on some narrative that somewhere along the line, you know, we decided was important based on a couple events that occurred in our past um, that are so powerful in terms of outcomes. 
So the more we can hold those stories a little bit more loosely and provide space to create new stories, I think is you know a, a way to approach growth and change in a way that is perhaps a little bit less intimidating. I love that. And, and constantly changing the narrative, you know, I want to ask you, have, in the past 10 years of your life, have you changed your own interpretation of, of your own life narrative in any ways? Because I, I, I feel like I almost interpret your story in a different way than the media interprets your story. And uh, do you agree with the way the media always interprets your story? You know, these are sort of questions I have for you. Yeah, it's it's a, that's a great question. I love this question, and I think about this a lot. Like, it, you know, I, you know, if you read, there's plenty of stories about me on the internet. A lot of them, most of them, get it wrong. Uh, factually, I think so too. oh, you mean factually? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, factually they get it wrong. But also, the story is sort of, you know, I woke up one day and changed my life, and everything right. changed overnight. You know, and it's just like not true. It's like not true. Like my growth. You know, I was introduced to spiritual principles in 1998 when I went to rehab, and then I spent the next 10 years applying them, you know, very poorly in my life, slowly growing. And then, you know, at 40, I was like, I need another change. I'm 54 now. So it's, you know, these things happen. They're like tectonic plates shifting slowly over decades to, you know, kind of, you know, produce the person that I am today. Um, also, there's this narrative that, that you know, adopting a plant-based diet solved my addiction problem. You know, there's like all <laughs> kinds of weird, you know, ideas out there that, that, that get it completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, and I think on top, when I layering on top of that is the fact that, you know, I'm often on podcasts like, like yours and being asked to recount the facts of my story. Mm. Um, and I always try to not just like, I can easily knee-jerk answer these questions. You know, I, I have a keynote speech where I tell my story over an hour, yeah. and 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 it becomes so rote that I often think, did that even happen? Like, it's just yeah. total bullshit. You like, you know, I know what you mean. and, and I'll, I'll call myself out, and I was like, that's not really what happened. Is that what happened? Like, memory is such an unpredictable, you know, yeah. it's just unreliable in that regard, and so. After repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, you know, I have to const constantly go like just because you said that ten times before doesn't mean that it's true if it didn't actually happen that way. So, I am always trying to deconstruct the story a little bit more. And every time I'm asked, I I, I do really try to, you know, mine my awareness to to you know remember it differently, not remember it differently, or try to remember some different aspect of it so I can approach the truth of it. Um, but it's hard because after you've said it so many times, like what is true and what isn't true? I mean, certainly, you know, the facts that I've related are, are correct, but um, the emotional experience of that at the time, um, I'm always questioning whether that's actually how it went down or not. Yeah. You know, making meaning of our lives is so intimately tied with the narratives that we tell about our life. And, you know, when I, when I see you, as I try to look as objectively as possible, um, not being influenced by what people tell me or the narrative of your life. This is, here's one thing I notice about you. There's something in psychology we call, um, this is actually only re really recent research. You know, people have talked about different paths to the good life. Um, throughout the course of human history, people have debated different paths of the good life. Some people argue it's happiness and hedonia, um, you know, uh, Aristotle and, and others talked about eudaimonia, you know, meaning and, um, and, and virtue. But more recent years, there's been a kind of a third path identified that's just simply the psychologically rich life. And I wrote an article for Scientific American about this called The Psychological Rich Life that I'll send you because I see a lot of it in your own uh, patterns of behavior. You know, you, it's important to look at, it's important to unearth beneath the labels, you know, we can get stuck by these labels, you know, that it's funny if people ask you that question, well, didn't you just convert your addiction to um, your podcast? And it's such a simplistic um, question because what, what you've done is, you know, you, you have this rich uh, drive for varied, novel, exciting, and challenging experiences, you know, this is, this probably showed up very early in your life, you know, and, um, and you've, 
you've now integrated that and accepted it into something that's causing greater service to society than than drinking alcohol. But you know, it's couldn't one frame the story in in in, in a similar way and say you just you've always had this yearning for the psychologically rich life and um and and now you're integrating it more with your uh, drive to uh, contribute positively to the world. It's just become it's just become more well integrated. But it's it's uh, couldn't that be part of the story? I, 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 I love that the story. I'll take that version of the story. That sounds good to me. Can I, I, mean, can I redo I your story? <laughs> I'm always trying to. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it goes back to, it's it's all been, you know, a slow journey of imperfect growth, and there's mm-hmm. little inflection points a- along the way where I decide to start something new or do something different, um, but, you know, it's peppered with me being identified as a certain type of person like you're a lawyer you're a swimmer you're an alcoholic uh you're a uh you're a vegan triathlete now and that was one i was terrified of being pigeonholed as especially you know as a vocation it's like there's a shelf life on being a competitive athlete you know i i'm interested in other things and the things that i learned uh in health and nutrition and fitness and endurance and the like are just a part of who I am. And I wanted right. to continue that trajectory. And the podcast is a reflection of that. It's a dynamic, you know, living, breathing thing that's always changing and is a, is, you know, is a mirror into like what I happen to be interested in at the time or what I'm struggling with at the time. That's exactly right. I, I think the reason, one reason why I identify it with that in that how I see it in you is because I identify with it. You know, that's why I love doing a podcast as well. And some people might say like, the psychology it's so general you know like why didn't you pick like why didn't you pick one specific thing like the psychology of and it's because well i want to live a psychologically rich life and that's just who i am you know i choose that over um over uh just picking one narrow thing and going in in great depth you know uh, um uh you know becoming more of a generalist and just ravenous curiosity so I just see that in you as well. And I think the the more people can just accept that within themselves and not feel like they need to um, almost be an apologist for it. Like, I feel like you shouldn't have to be an apologist. And, 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 and what someone might do as an apologist is start to um, create n- narratives about themselves that almost are an apology kind of narrative. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, like someone might, I'm not saying you've done this necessarily, but you do see this sometimes in, in, in the desire to conform to society's um, expectation or what, of what's normal or what one should be. Sometimes people, you know, sorry, well, you know, I, yeah, I know that I, you know, suffered from all this and I regretful of those days as opposed to say, well, no, those days were actually really important early um, uh, understanding of some seeds of who I actually am, <laughs> you know, like, right. sorry, not right. sorry, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a very, it's, I think it's a very common struggle. You know, I think we live in a world in which, uh, social expectation and, and, uh, external validation and keeping up with the Joneses are all like incredibly powerful forces that drive people's decisions some of which are, you know, really critical life decisions. Which career am I going to pursue? Where am I going to live? What, you know, kind of, uh, you know, where, what is, where I'm going to live? You you know, what does the house look like that I'm going to live at? Like these things, instead of being um, motivated by some interconnected awareness of what works for you, are really a function of what everybody else is doing. Absolutely. So, well, you've carved this, this unique path for yourself. And um, I actually want to read an Abraham Maslow quote to you that I think you'll really like. I think we'll, we'll mutually geek out over this. He wrote, one can choose to go back toward safety or forward toward growth. Growth must be chosen. Growth must be chosen again and again. Fear must be overcome again and again. So that's the quote, the Maslow quote, and, and that was the basis for my revised hierarchy of needs because you know how you know how the static triangle or the, the how is usually presented. He never drew a triangle. <laughs> he never drew a pyramid. He always made the case that life was a two-step forward, one-step back dynamic. Life wasn't like a video game where you reach, oh, I've got that sorted, and now I'm going to go to the next level. You know, you always have to choose growth. And I just thought that would resonate with you because it seems at the heart of a lot of your uh, writings. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, 
choosing growth is a daily struggle. Like who wants to grow? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I've just had, I've had enough of it. So I have a taste of how much better my life is when I, when I recommit to it, but that doesn't mean that it gets any easier. And in fact, you know, I remember when I was newly sober, somebody said to me, you know, like, Oh, the road narrows. And I, I didn't know what that meant. Like, Oh, you know, you can't, once you get sober, okay, you get rid of the the drugs and alcohol, but like now you can't do this and now you can't do, like your your life can, can, it gets stripped away of the things in your life that don't serve you. And then you're asked to step up and address those and it's a never ending process. And, you know, it's relentless. And sometimes, you know, I just want to watch Netflix. Like, I don't, you know, I don't want to deal with it. And that's the, and and that's okay too, right? Like, and then, then there's like, oh, well, are you willing to forgive yourself? Like, you know, it's a constant process uh, that I think we all grapple with in our own ways. You know, I mean, you become an inspirational figure, whether or not you you set out to or you want to be, you know, the the objective fact. No, I I read, you know, you sent me your new book and I've been devouring it. I've been reading it on the beach here (laughs) and, you know, looking at the sunset to inspire, you know, I get all the additional things in addition to reading your book that that inspire me, you know, and I try to, you know, I listen to like meditative music. So all these things are happening at once, but, but reading the content of, of the book and, and the stories that you've highlighted that are not stories about yourself, but you're, you're transcending yourself by telling other people's stories. A lot of stories, you, you have said that what excites you the most is telling the stories of those who um, have not been heard before, you know, um, the underdog in a lot of ways, right? So that self, that sort of self transcendent motive that you have is um, is part of you as well. There is that there is that motive um, as well. Where do you, where do you think that um, you know? At what point? Like when when did you when did you because tra- to me that's the third transformation that I see. Remember we started off this whole podcast and I said uh, I see actually at least three major trans. The the third one I want to really zoom in on right now. It seems like you are entering more of this generative stage in the Erickson model of human development, the generative stage where your your mastery. You're not so obsessed with mastery anymore. You know that seemed to be transition two, right? Transition three tends to be more of um, wanting to tell other people's stories. But how do you see it? This is just how I see it, but I want to hear how you see it. Yeah, I mean I think that's fair. Uh, you know, the podcast is such a fantastic medium for sharing other people's stories. And, you know, it was a medium that I got interested in. You know, I was a very early adopter uh, as a consumer of podcasts when I was training for these races and would have to spend unbelievable amounts of time, you know, alone and couldn't listen to music all that time in an era where it was tricky to get, you had to download them on your desktop and bounce them to your MP3 player. Like you had to be very intentional about it. But I fell in love with long form conversation at the same time as, you know, my investment in Alcoholics Anonymous was growing, where I would sit in these rooms and listen to people share their stories with extreme courage and vulnerability Mm. uh, to an audience of people who would then embrace them. And it's really a transformative experience with being bearing witness to that and then being asked to do it yourself. Um, And so I think, um, you know, I wanted to give people who aren't part of that community a taste of what that feels like. Um, I wanted to be more expressive of that ethos in my own life um, and celebrate, you know, celebrate, you know, people who, like you said, have incredible stories that I think are really empowering and inspiring that aren't, you know, as well heard or understood as uh, as I think they should be and and not make it about me you know it's not yeah. it's not about me but it is about um, what I can hopefully facilitate in that person and it, it's about me in that I'm selecting these people and there's a reason you know that I'm making that choice and there's something that I want to learn from that person as well so I straddle this line between you know this figure that people look to for you know, I don't. I don't consider myself an inspirational figure. I think it's more right. there's there's an aspirational aspect to it, and that comes from people being able to identify some aspect of themselves in me. Like when you look at LeBron James, he's inspirational. He's not, but he's not aspirational because you're never gonna you can't connect with that guy because he's 
he's just so much better than everybody else, <laughs> you know, at what he does that, you know, there's a barrier, I think, that comes up. You can't emotionally connect with that. And I I'm trying I to connect with you, Rich. <laughs> well, so what I'm saying is, oh. yeah, I'm the I'm in between. Right. Like mm. I've done some interesting things that 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 that, you know, in the athletic world or other things that people are like, wow, how'd you do that? But I'm not so um, advanced in that that people can't oh, see. see some aspect of themselves in their own struggles. So like when I went, I was very aware of that when I wrote Finding Ultra. Like I, you know, I'm not an Olympic athlete. I've never, you know, never won a race. My story connected with people because I was willing to be honest and vulnerable about stuff that's like kind of scary to talk about yeah. and bring people in on this journey with me. And so in that regard, I'm more of a guide. Like I'm not the guy at the top of the mountain saying, here's how you do it. Right. I'm saying, hey man, I figured out a few things. I'm still trying to learn, like come along with me and like, let's learn, let's learn these things together. Oh, for sure. That's why I kind of said whether you want it or not, you're an you're inspiring figure. You know, that's why I, I added that nuance when I was when I was saying this. You know, mm -hmm. uh, or whether or not it was intentional or not. You know, but your living by example inspires a lot of people. One thing that's really ins inspirational people is the fact that you can accomplish um, such seemingly impossible uh, feats of athleticism, and you've talked about almost the uh, mundanity of it. The moon how mundane. You know, t it's all about taking little tiny steps and you made me think of this great article by the sociologist William Chambliss um, which I emailed you uh, right before this chat called The Mundanity of Excellence an ethnographic report on stratification and Olympic swimmers uh, my colleague Dan Angela Duckworth uh, who studies grit we, we this is our favorite paper like we always talk about this paper and we um, actually emailed William Chambliss and we're like how is your paper not more well known? And I think you're going to love it when you when you read it because it seems to dovetail so nicely with your own process of um, accomplishing what seems to be so um, broad. So, for instance, in training for an Ironman triathlon, um, you've said uh, you know you think okay, I'm going to have to get in the water, and then once I'm in the water, then I'm going to take a lap, you know. But you you see one thing follows another, right? And this seems to to dovetail nicely with uh, Chambliss's work. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think that that all great things are made brick by brick, and we're in a culture where we all want the overnight success, and we want to mm -hmm. expedite our way to the result. And the focus is so much on the end point, and there's not any appreciation for the journey or the hard rot like road that you have to trudge to achieve anything exceptional. And in my own life everything that I've been able to be successful at was really something that started very humbly and that I showed up for every single day, fell in love with the process of the building of it, not overly focused with the end point <laughs> of where it was headed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you wake up a decade later and it's a thing, you know, but, yeah. and I said this, I've said this before, I did a tweet about it recently as well, that most people I think are, are, um, very poor predictors of the timeline required to, you know, do anything exceptional. Like, yeah. I think we wildly overestimate what we can do in a year and, and wildly underestimate what we can do in a decade. And I look at things in decade terms and then I forget about it and I just focus on what the thing in front of me is to do. So if you're running an ultra marathon and you're running out of gas, you got to break it down into the tiniest pieces, one step in front of another. Or you wake up in the morning and you don't want to get out of bed and go outside and do the run. Just sit up. You know, okay, I sat up. Now put your feet on the ground. You know, just break it down into the tiniest little pieces. You know, I'm on 560 some odd podcasts at this point on a show that I started eight years ago. But when I began it, I didn't know if I'd do a second episode. I was doing it for fun. And then I found it to be creatively fulfilling and wanted to do it again. So it's really been a function of following my curiosity and just being in love with the doing rather than the, uh, you know, the result of the doing. And it's detaching emotionally, being detached from those results, I think, that is something that we don't spend enough time focusing on. Yeah, I would almost say that you're you really enjoy the becoming even more than the doing, but mm -hmm. I guess that's just a matter of semantics. Um, you've uh, 
You've inspired me to. This is my third week as a vegan. Oh, nice! Isn't that cr- awesome. it's crazy, right? Like, <laughs> well, I said, you know, what? well, if, if Fritch can do it, you know, like, I'm, let me give it a try. You know, let me give it a try. Um, How's it going? This is my third week. I um, I get uh, what I've done is I get delivery from Trifecta Nutrition, just the vegan plan, and a hundred percent. I've changed my whole plan uh, from because I, I I do meal delivery because I have celiac, so I think eat gluten free anyway. But um, I said, you know what? Change it. I said, I called them up. I said, you know what? Rich roll. I learned I learned about this stuff. Just change it all up to vegan. And I. So what are my thoughts about it on week three? Well, um, I've cheated a couple times. I'm gonna be honest. Um, I love making cheese with nachos. So I kind of uh, cheated once um, or twice. But I will say I have more energy. Um, I definitely feel like I have more energy. Um, yeah, my head feels my head feels less cloudy, which is good. You know, um, so I want to see. I want to see what I can do. I want to see. Give it. I want to give it a go for three months at least. What do you? What do? You, what are your suggestions for me? <laughs> um, I think that's great. Uh, yeah, give it a go. Give it an honest go, and um, don't beat yourself up for those little missteps. Yeah. You know, I think it's like you said with Maslow. It's like this is not a linear thing. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people. With any kind of diet, you know, they 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 you know have a weak moment and then they just you know abandon the whole thing. So just use it as a learning experience to Definitely. adjust and pay attention to how your body feels and figure it out. I think these these transitions take time. Like your gut microbiome has to adjust to a, you know a difference in the kind of foods that you're eating and all that kind of stuff. And just be patient with it. But I'm excited and I'm a resource. Yeah. So feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. Thank you so much. That does mean a lot to me. I'm, I'm excited too. I, I do get excited by these by new things as well. You know, like like extreme things. I'm an all in kind of guy too, brother. <laughs> so yeah. I hear you. My last question for today. Um, at one point, you had said your motto is "mood follows action." I was wondering, do you have a a new motto for the for this moment today, uh, the very very end of 2020, uh, perhaps one of the worst years in human history. Do I have a new motto? I don't know that I have a new motto. Um, I think, you know, a a good one right now, because we're measuring this year against our expectations of what we thought it should be. And we're starting to think about the new year and what we want that to look like. And my suggestion is to, like, let it go, man. Like, let it go. Like, in so many ways... We're being forced to surrender, um, and it's uncomfortable. You know, this idea that we don't have the level of control over, you know, so many things is like an epiphany for a lot of people, right? Yeah. Uh, we delude ourselves into thinking we we have exigency over so many things that we actually don't. And I think this year made that made a, made a lot of us very presently aware of that fact. So. Whatever expectations you have, whether it's when am I going to, you know, things getting back to normal or um, what the new administration is going to hark in, like, I, you know, I would just let it all go and focus on controlling the controllables. And those controllables are very few. They're what you put in your mouth, the thoughts that you entertain and what comes out of your mouth, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, how are you going to behave? Are you going to react mm-hmm. to everything? Or are you going to mindfully respond? And again, it goes back to being in the moment. Like, what is the next right thing for you to do? And the more present we can be, I think the more, the the better equipped we are to navigate whatever the new year throws at us. Oh, that what a perfect way to end not this only this podcast, but also this year. Uh, so thank you so much, Rich, for uh, t- chatting with me today. It was a real delight for me. I hope it was for you as well. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in on the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.